So I honestly have the cup of coffee, mostly because I like caffeine and coffee, but so that my hands aren't like just flailing all over the place. It helps keep me under control, surprisingly enough. With Shake and Bacon, I'm Joni Simon. Welcome to my studio. This is where I do food photography. So if you are into that, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. But meanwhile, I get all sorts of requests for new videos, which I totally love, because that means I don't have to come up with the ideas. You guys are super helpful like that. So I've been keeping track of them, but there's been a couple that continue to pop up over and over again. And so I put it to a poll the other day on Instagram and said, okay guys, which one do you want to see first? And well, lo and behold, this this video that you are watching right now was the top voted one. The other one that wasn't the winner will be up next week because again, lots of people requested it. But for now, we are talking about dark food photography. You know, when you're scrolling Instagram and you see those really moody photos, there's a lot of dark shadows, they're kind of a little maybe edgy, not always, but definitely there's a lot of dark tones in it. So what I wanna show you today is how I do that in my studio. So the topic of dark food photography, just like any topic in the world of photography, can get super complicated really quickly. It's, you know, there's all this what if that and this kind of lighting scenario and then blah, 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 blah. Then, so I want to keep it super simple today and I'm purely going to show you how I shoot dark food photography. This is by no means the way that everybody has to do it, but hopefully what you'll see today are just some helpful things that depending on your scenario, your gear, your setup that you can apply to your photography. But I will share the caveat that this is specifically geared towards those who are shooting with continuous light source. So that would be those of you who are shooting with natural light out of a window, or for those of you who are shooting with some other continuous light source, right? We're not talking flash photography, we're talking the light is persistently on, just like the light that is lighting my face right now. And that's why I use LEDs, because they work both for my still photography as well as my videos. So if that sounds good to you and you want in on this party, well, just stick around. I'm gonna show you exactly how I shoot and edit dark food photography. So I've got my scene all set up here and I'm gonna go through all of it so you understand the decisions I've made in order to really make this ideal for dark food photography. But before we do that, I want you to think about dark food images that you've seen before. Maybe even jump on Instagram right now and start thumbing through hashtag dark food photography. And what you will very quickly notice is the way the light is used. So when you're doing dark food photography, dark photography in general, instead of letting the light spill out to everywhere like we might typically do when we're just shooting food on a kitchen table or somewhere else, the light is going everywhere. It's coming from window or it's coming from a light source. It's not restricted. Well, in this case, what we are doing is we are severely restricting the light. We are only allowing it to go through a very narrow area so that it lands on our subject, illuminates the subject, that's where the highlights will be placed, and that everywhere else is all in shadow. And that's when we get that really cool dark effect. So this is then where you might have heard that term thrown around, light modifiers. So these can be things as simple as a black card, right? We've got our black foam core, which I always have all over the studio. This is actually a piece of a larger piece of foam core, which I have just broken down, cut down to the size that I need. But there are, of course, professional light modifiers. But this is just the cheap MacGyver version of a light modifier. Now, additionally, a lot of artificial lights will have things that will restrict the light as well. Like the LEDs that I shoot with have barn doors over them that can, again, narrow the light, block out the light, keep it from spilling over all over to the scene. I mean, Light, in a lot of ways, is very similar to water. If you restrict it, it's only gonna go through this one little area as opposed to pouring out all over your scene. Make sense? So as far as what we've got going on here, just to walk you through all of the setup so that maybe you can replicate this at home with what you've got, I have the Westcott LED Flex Mat. It is an amazing light. It is not a cheap light. It's quite expensive. Actually, it took me a long time to save up for it, but it more or less replicates daylight. And so you can just imagine, just pretend instead of being my Flex Mat, that is your window, okay? So that's where your window is at. Now this Flex Mat does have diffusion material over it, but you know I live that diffused life and I want that really soft light hitting onto the chocolate truffles that I've got in this scene. Then I have this additional diffuser just to further soften the light. It's what I'm going for, so it makes me happy. Of course, that may not be your style, so in which case, ditch the diffuser, you, you do you. So then if we think through, okay, well we have the light coming through, diffused light onto our scene, which I've got constructed here. How do I minimize that light? Well, that's where then we bust out the light modifiers, the black foam core. Now you guys have seen the regular, like the big sheets of it, right? Here, hold on. Oh wait, I had one right here. Well, 
<laughs> we got plenty of foam core. So this is the big stuff. You can buy this at Hobby Lobby, Joanne Fabrics, craft stores, Michaels, wherever you may be in the world that has craft supplies, even office supply stores have this stuff. And it's super cheap, it's a couple bucks per board. I have this all over the place. But then what I can do is I can surround our scene with that black foam core so that we are severely limiting the light throughout the scene. You can see, for example, I've created this little house <laughs> for our truffles here. And actually what I used, one of our favorite little things from the food styling video are the T-pins. So what I did is I took two pieces of foam core that I folded and then I inserted a T-pin here and a T-pin here just to hold it together. So literally it's made a little house. Now when I take the shot, I'm not gonna get this in the scene. I'm purely gonna go in at this angle and get the truffles. But then what this is doing is shielding the light. Now you say, well, Joni, can't you just put it up on the sides? Well, yes, definitely. If you are shooting in a completely dark room, you could definitely do that. But as as you can see, even in this completely dark room that I'm in right now, I have my single light source. It is still spilling light throughout the space. And so you're gonna get light coming in through the top. So if you really wanna dial down those shadows, you wanna more or less box the whole thing in. But then now you're gonna notice, okay, well, we've got the back really shielded. There's some really great shadows in there. That's gonna taper off beautifully. It's gonna look great. But we've still got a lot of light coming through here. And we want the light to be driven right onto this front truffle right here, this little guy right here. <laughs> so I want to put all of this right here in shadow. I don't want this to be the subject. I want this little dish of cocoa powder to be a part of the story because that's what the chocolate got tossed around in. It's telling the story of the truffles, but I don't want that to take center stage. So what I do is I take another piece of foam core and that's when we really start to restrict the light. And that literally we just have a solitary opening right here. Can you see it? Can you see it? We've got an opening about that wide where light is coming in. Everything else is dark. Now there's a little bit of light spilling in from here and that's, that's okay. So once you've got this little narrow opening where the light is coming through, which is so lovely and beautiful, we start to really take notice of where is it falling. And so in this situation, it's falling on the truffles. Now I might want to move those truffles around so that I get it right on that front truffle. I don't want the whole truffle illuminated, but just that side, I want that really nice round softness kind of reaching around the front of the truffle. And I don't want the back truffles too illuminated. Now, they're a little too bright for me, so that's when I grab other things such as this, my happy place, which actually my friend Shauna gave me. This was supposed to be a decoration, but Shauna, I'm sorry, it's turned into a tool for photography. So what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm gonna open up my little door here so there's a little bit more light coming in, but then I'm gonna use this just to block the back half because I still want some of the light that is coming in through the top, right? Like I like that illumination that it's doing over the scene kind of spilling in there, but I wanna eliminate the brighter highlight that's hitting on that back truffle so that we can really bring that front truffle to the forefront. That's where the majority of the light is hitting and that our eyeballs, when we look at this image, go straight to that truffle. So now one other helpful thing just to bear in mind when you're setting up a scene like this, especially when you're picking props, is that it is a good idea that for the most part, everything be dark, right? We've got a dark surface, we've got a dark backdrop, I've got dark linens, I've got dark props. I mean, there's a little bit of light and bright coming in there that's gonna help communicate some texture and some interest. But for the most part, everything's dark so that the food is what pops. Because if I were to place, for example, this white ramekin in the scene, this white ramekin very instantly would become the focal point, whether I wanted it to be or not, simply because it's the brightest thing in the image. So just knowing that using darker things is going to help them sort of meld in well with the scene and really, again, bring the focus to the food. So from there, I make any other little last minute tweaks or changes, I take my shots, I go, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I can't wait to jump over to my computer and edit in Lightroom because there are a couple things that are helpful to know in Lightroom just to make sure you really really capitalize on those shadows and really even out the highlights. So now I've taken that image that we shot over there, uploaded the raw file here into Lightroom and we are going to make some editing adjustments to it. So first thing, what I always do, just even out that image so that our horizon line is directly horizontal, right? That we've got 180 degrees right across the image. That feels a lot better. And then because this is a dark image, I typically will cool it off just a skosh because I always think in terms of color temperature when you're in the shade, it's just a little bit cooler. So we're gonna go ahead and rock couple degrees cooler there. Now I am gonna increase the exposure, but I'm not gonna go maybe as far as I could because there are some further adjustments that I'm gonna make down below that are gonna bump up that brightness for me. So 
hang tight. I'm actually not gonna touch the contrast here. A lot of folks will definitely throw a lot of contrast on dark food photography to fill in those shadows, but I'm actually gonna leave the contrast as it is. Now from here, what I'm gonna do is I am gonna dial down the highlights a bit and that's gonna darken it and you're like, ah, but it's okay, hang in there, hang in there. It's sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. <laughs> And then I'm gonna bring up the shadows just a little bit so that we get just a little bit more definition and information about those truffles. And then I'm gonna pull up the whites to retrieve again some of that light. Oh, see, mm, that is making a difference right there. <laughs> And then I'm also gonna pull up the black so it's not quite so dark because I am gonna throw down the shadows in the tone curve. I, know, I already know I'm gonna do this. This is what happens. You start doing a lot of editing in Lightroom and you just know the settings that are coming later so you're not going quite as far on the individual adjustments as you're going through them. All right, now in dark food photography, I generally do bump up the clarity. I mean, in my editing in general, I bump up the clarity, but here I find it especially important because we really do wanna pull those textures out. We really do want some definition and it's not just all dead black space. All right, so now we are jumping into the tone curve. And for me, this is where I feel a lot of the magic happens as it relates to dark food photography because you can really dial back those shadows. You can really even out the highlights. And again, draw the attention to our subject. That is what it is all about that is the name of the game and photography in general but especially here we have pointed that light at a very specific place and we really want to make that glow all right so we've got our tone curve and this is very similar to how I generally edit photos. If you watch my other tutorial on Lightroom and how I kind of generally edit, this, these are some of the same exact things that I do there. So I'm gonna lift those blacks just a little bit. And this is where you can kind of get that vintagey feel that sometimes you see in images. We call that crushing the blacks, right? So it's kind of lightening those up. Feels a little bit hazy, but don't worry, we're gonna fix it. But then you can also see we're getting a lot more light on those props, which I don't necessarily want. So we're gonna fix that now by doing some finer adjustments in the curve. I'm gonna go ahead and brighten up the lights there. Actually gonna pull up the darks further, but then where the magic happens is in the shadows, right? And we just pull that down doo, 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 right there. Oh, a little far, well, Actually, I think it's about right. <laughs> this is where you sit and you hmm and you ha and you decide how far you wanna take it. But I think that's just about right. Now this next area is one of my favorites. Well, I mean, it's all my favorites. <laughs> let's be honest. But this is where you can really extract a lot of richness out of any of the color that is in this dark image. So for example, I'm looking at this blue and I love that blue, but it is a little overpowering. So what I wanna do first is I wanna richen it up. So you take that luminance scale and you just dial that down. Oh my gosh, look how rich and fabulous that blue looks. But it is a little much. So I'm gonna go ahead and dial that blue down. Right there, looks good, looks good. So it's just a little bit softer, it's a little bit darker, it's not quite as distracting. But I still wanna bring more color and more energy out of those truffles. So I'm gonna do that by also reducing the luminance on the oranges. Because when you look at browns, it's usually either the reds or the oranges or the yellows that are coming through. In this scenario, it really has a lot to do with the oranges. And that's also, there's a lot of orange in that wood grain. So we're gonna go ahead and dial those back and then maybe even bump up the saturation a little bit. Look at that, look at that. Ooh, looks good. All right, and then I'm also gonna dial down the yellows so that we just get a little bit more richness on the edge of that plate. Kind of dulls it a little bit, which actually I like. Sometimes if something is overly bright, you can bring down that luminance. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Luminance is luminosity, brightness, but uh, just in terms of the quality of that color, it really helps. All right, I'm feeling pretty good. How are you guys feeling? You feeling okay? Still following along? Okay, now I'm gonna add some sharpening, but I'm gonna add a mask to that so that it is really just on the major parts of that. Again, if you've not seen that before, jump to my other Lightroom tutorial video. I talk all about that. And then keep on scrolling. And now we've got two more things that I usually apply before I do some final tweaks. So next one we've got is the post-crop vignetting. The vignetting, right? We can do this in all of our regular phone apps. This is something that is not news to everybody. But for me, this is just something that I say, use with caution because in lighter photography, when it's applied, sometimes you can see those really dark edges on the photos and it just, I don't know, it's kind of distracting to me. Whereas on dark photos, it blends in a little bit better and I'm gonna show you that actually really helps in this image because in that foreground, I've still got a little too much brightness for my personal taste. 
So just throwing that vignette on there. Okay, it's a little much here. We're gonna dial it back just a skosh. There we go. It darkens that foreground just a little bit, really tightening in our view to those truffles. But what I also love that it does is creates a little trail of light between the two dishes, right? Between the truffles and the cocoa powder. So we see that little trail of chocolate chips. I don't know, I just think it's a fun little detail and it makes me happy. All right, and then I am gonna throw a little dehaze on here. So I'm gonna lift the shadows just a little bit more, lift up the blacks just a little bit more. And that, that right there, that's that's what I was looking for, right? We get the story of the cocoa powder and how we just rolled those little truffles around in that. We've got the idea of chocolate because the chocolate chips, but we get all of that great texture that's on the outside of those truffles. We really get the detail of all the different things that you can put on the truffles. And it feels like you're in this sort of like mysterious barn house kitchen scenario, right? <laughs> or you're just here in my studio. <laughs> So I know that was a ton of information that I just threw at you and we literally went through an entire shoot from start to finish. So if you have any questions or you missed anything or you need clarification, that's what the comment section is below. I love responding to you guys, answering your questions because you know I just think back to when I started food photography, how helpful it would have been to have somebody who could just kinda you know shortcut some things for me instead of having to learn it all on my own, right? But hopefully this has got you all sorts of inspired and you were super excited Excited to go pick up your camera and start shooting some dark food photography of your very own and if you do please tag me over on Instagram I would absolutely love to see what you're doing give you a double thumbs up give you some encouragement and support because you know that's what we all do here right we're all here to support each other in our food photography endeavors so anyway thank you so much for stopping by I hope you have a fantastic day hope you stay out of trouble and I will see you very very soon all right bye Recording, we're recording. Now you know this is the second time I'm filming this. <laughs> Cause guess who forgot to push record last time? <laughs> now here's where I think a lot of the magic happens for Duke. <laughs> All right, let's see, let's see. Do we have Lightroom open? We do. All right.